Section 9 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Section 9. THE WAR WITH SPAIN CHAPTER Five, PART Four. Particularly gallant was the part played by the Gloucester, a converted yacht with no armor under Commander Wainwright. She was lying inshore near the harbor mouth and opened with her little rapid-fire guns on the great battleships as they swept past. Then, the moment the Spanish destroyers, Furor and Pluton, appeared, she rushed straight upon them with absolute disregard of the shore batteries. Within twenty minutes the Pluton went down in deep water, and the Fuhrer was beached and sunk. THE DESTROYER OF DESTROYERS July 3, 1898 From Santiago, spurring the morrow, Spain's ships come steaming, big with black sorrow, over the ocean, first on our roster, runs Richard Wainwright, glad on the Gloucester. Boast him and toast him, Wainwright, the Gloucester. Great ships and gaunt ships, steel-clad and sable, roll on resplendent, monsters of fable. Crash all our cannon, quick maxims rattle, red death and ruin, rush through the battle, red death and dread death, ravage and rattle. Speed on, Spain's cruisers, towers of thunder, calm rides the Gloucester. Moro roars at her, enemies looming, on their wakes heave her, vast through the glooming, thunders and wonders speak from the glooming. Sped our Spain's cruisers, then mid the clangor, dart her destroyers, lurid with anger, shouts Richard Wainwright, quivers the Gloucester, where the Fuhrer goes, Wainwright has crossed her, boast him and toast him. Wainwright, the Gloucester. Wide to the westward, El Furor flutters, hid in bright vapors where Wainwright mutters. Under Socapa, races the faster, smiles at Spain's gunners, laughs at disasters, aiming and flaming faster and faster. Wide to the westward, El Pluton plunges, at her with rapiers now, Wainwright lunges, swords of fierce scarlet, blades blue as lightning, rapid guns snapping little guns brightening, four-pounders, six-pounders, lunging like lightning. Done the destroyers, blazing and bursting, berserker Wainwright rides to their worsting, seethe the Pluton sides, soon to exhaust her, flames the Furor's deck, doomed by the Gloucester, boast him and toast him, Wainwright, the Gloucester. Where the Pluton lies lifts the red leaven, fire clouds prodigious dash against heaven. Where the Pluton lay, void swells the ocean, shattered and sunken, spent her devotion, waves where wet graves were, deep in the ocean. Shrieking toward Cuba, agonized, broken, El Fior is hasting, her fate bespoken. There in the shallows, mid the white surges, her guns, deserted, moan out their dirges, swelling and knelling through the white surges. Wainwright in mercy does his endeavor, some he shall rescue, more rest for ever. Say a prayer for them, one kindly ave. Spain weeps her wounded, wails a lost navy. Fails them, bewails them, says them an ave. Off Santiago, when from beleaguer rushed forth Cervera, daring and eager, who stood Spain's onset, who met and tossed her, Wainwright, the mains man, glad on the Gloucester, boast him and toast him, Wainwright, the Gloucester. Wallace Rice The evolutions of the Brooklyn, under Commodore Winfield Scott Schley, have been the subject of bitter controversy. Schley, finding himself too near the Spaniards, made a wide turn away from them, wishing, he afterwards alleged, to preserve his ship, which was the fastest of our squadron, to head off any of the Spanish ships which might escape. THE BROOKLYN AT SANTIAGO JULY 3rd, 1898 Twixt clouded heights, Spain hurls to doom ships staunch and brave. 
Majestic forth they flash and boom upon the wave. El Moro raises eyes of hate far out to sea, And speeds Cervera to his fate with cannonry. The Brooklyn o'er the deep espies his flame-wreathed side, She sets her banners on the skies in fearful pride. On to the harbor's mouth of fire, fierce for the fray, She darts an eagle from his ire upon her prey. She meets the brave Teresa there, sigh, sigh for Spain, And beats her clanging armor bare with glittering rain. The bold Vicaya's lightnings glance into the throng, Where loud the bannered Brooklyn chants her awful song. Down swoops in one tremendous curve our Commodore, His broadsides roll, the foemen swerve toward the shore. In one great round his Brooklyn turns, and girdling there, This side and that with glory burns Spain to despair. Frightful in onslaught, fraught with fate, her missiles hiss. The Spaniard sees, when all too late, a nemesis. The Oquendo's de absence swells, then, torn and lame, Her portholes turn to yawning wells, geysers of flame. Yet fierce and fiercer breaks and cries our rifles dread. The doomed Teresa shudders, lies stark with her dead. How true the Brooklyn's battery speaks, Eulate knows, as the Vicaya's staggers shrieks her horrent woes. Sideward she plunges, never more shall Biscay feel her heart throb for the ship that wore her name in steel. The Okendo's ports a moment shone, as gloomed her knell. She trembles, bursts, the ship is gone, headlong to hell. The fleet, colon, in lonely flight, Spain's hope, Spain's fear, sees, and it lends her wings to fright, Schley's pennant near. The fleet, colon, scuds on alone, God, how she runs, and ever hears behind her moan the Brooklyn's guns. Our ruthless cannon o'er the flood roar and draw nigh, Spain's ensign stained with golden blood falls from on high. The world she gave the world has passed, gone with her power, dead neath the Brooklyn's thunder blast in one great hour. The bannered Brooklyn, gallant crew and gallant Schley, proud is the flag his sailors flew along the sky. Proud is his country, for each star our union wears, the fighting Brooklyn shows a scar so much he dares god save us war upon the seas but if it slip send us a chief with men like these on such a ship wallace rice the oregon which had arrived from her fifteen thousand mile voyage from san francisco also took a conspicuous part in the battle and did splendid service the rush of the oregon they held her south to Magellan's mouth, then east they steered her forth, through the farther gate of the crafty strait, and then they held her north. Six thousand miles to the Indian Isles, and the Oregon rushed home, her wake a swirl of jade and pearl, her bow a bend of foam. And when at Rio the cable sang, there is war, grim war with Spain, the swart crews grinned and stroked their guns, and thought on the mangled main. In the glimmered gloom of the engine room there was joy to each grimy soul, and fainting men sprang up again and piled the blazing coal. Good need was there to go with care, but every sailor prayed, or gun for gun or six to one, to meet them, unafraid. Her goal at last, with joyous blast, she hailed the welcoming roar, of hungry sea-wolves curved along the strong-hilled Cuban shore. Long nights went by, her beamed eye unwavering searched the bay, where trapped and penned for a certain end the Spanish squadron lay. Out of the harbor a curl of smoke, a watchful gun rang clear. Out of the channel the squadron broke like a bevy of frightened deer. Then there was the shouting for steam, more steam, and fires glowed white and red, and guns were manned and ranges planned, and the great ships leaped ahead. Then there was a roaring of coursing guns, shatter of shell and spray, 
and who but the rushing Oregon was fiercest in chase and fray? For her mighty wake was a seething snake, her bow was a billow of foam. Like the mailed fists of an angry white, her shot drove crashing home. Pride of the Spanish navy, ho, flee like a wounded beast, for the ship of the far northeast. In quivering joy she surged ahead, aflame with flashing bars, till down sunk the Spaniards gold and red, and up ran the clustered stars. Glory to share, ay, and to spare, but the chiefest is hers by right, of a rush of fourteen thousand miles for the chance of a bitter fight. Arthur Gieterman The high quality of American marksmanship was never more conclusively shown than in this battle. The Spanish ships were literally blown to pieces. Here, as at Manila, the victory had been won by the men behind the guns. THE MEN BEHIND THE GUNS A cheer and salute for the admiral, and here's to the captain bold, and never forget the commodore's debt when the deeds of might are told. They stand to the deck through the battle's wreck when the great shells roar and screech, and never they fear when the foe is near to practice what they preach. But off with your hat and three times three for Columbia's true blue sons. The men below who batter the foe, the men behind the guns. O oh, light and merry of heart are they when they swing into port once more, when with more than enough of the greenback stuff they start for their leave ashore. And you'd think, perhaps, that the blue-bloused chaps who loll upon the street are a tender bit with salt on it for some fierce moustache to eat, some warrior bold with straps of gold who dazzles and fairly stuns, the modest worth of the sailor boys, the lads who serve the guns. But say not a word till the shot is heard that tells the fight is on, till the long deep roar grows more and more from the ships of Yank and Don, till over the deep the tempests sweep of fire and bursting shell, and the very air is a mad despair in the throes of a living hell. Then down, deep down, in the mighty ship, unseen by the midday suns, you'll find the chaps who are giving the raps, the men behind the guns. Oh, well, they know how the cyclones blow, that they loose from their cloud of death, and they know is heard the thunder word their fierce ten-incher saith. The steel decks rock with a lightning shock, and shake with the great recoil, and the sea grows red with the blood of the dead, and reaches for his spoil. But not till the foe has gone below, or turns his prow and runs, shall the voice of peace bring sweet release to the men behind the guns. John Jerome Rooney Admiral Pascual de Cervera, in command of the Spanish fleet, knew from the first how desperate the venture was. He made it only because forced to do so by direct orders from Madrid, the Spanish authorities fearing that Santiago would be taken and the whole fleet be made captive. Cervera Hail to thee, a gallant foe! Well hast thou struck thy blow, hopeless of victory, daring unequal strife, valuing more than life, honor, and chivalry. Forth from the harbor's room, rushing to meet thy doom, lit by the day's clear light, out to the waters free, out to the open sea, there should a sailor fight. Where the red battles roar, beats on the rocky shore, thunders proclaiming, how the great cannon's breath hurls forth a dreadful death, smoking and flaming. While her guns ring and flash, see each frail vessel dash, though our shots rend her. Swift through the iron rain, bearing the flag of Spain, scorning surrender. Hemmed in, twixt foe and wreck, blood soaks each slippery deck, still madly racing, till their ships burn and reel, crushed by our bolts of steel, firing and chasing. Driven to the rocks at last, now heals each shattered mast, flames the blood drinking. Each with her load of dead, wrapped in that shroud of red, silenced and sinking. Vanquished, but not in vain, ancient renown of Spain coming upon her. Once again lives in thee all her old chivalry, all her old honor. 
ever her past averse when wealth and land were hers though she might love them die for their keeping yet spain in her pride has set honor above them bertrand shadwell santiago surrendered a few days later and an army of occupation under general nelson a miles landed at puerto rico and took possession of the island after a few sharp skirmishes in the philippines operations against manila were pushed vigorously forward and on august thirteenth after sharp actions at malate singalan and ermita the city was captured among the killed at malate was sergeant j a mcelwraith battery h third artillery regulars mcelwraith of malate august thirteenth eighteen ninety eight yes yes my boy there's no mistake you put the contract through. You lads with Shafter I'll allow were heroes tried and true. But don't forget the men who fought about Manila Bay. And don't forget brave Mechelrath, who died at Malate. The night was black, save where the forks of tropic lightning ran, when with long, deep thunder roar the typhoon storm began. Then suddenly, above the din, we heard the steady bay of volleys from the trenches where the Pennsylvanians lay. The tenth, we thought, could hold their own against the feigned attack, and if the Spaniards dared advance, would pay them doubly back. But soon we marked the volleys sink into a scattered fire, and now we heard the Spanish guns boom nigher yet and nigher. Then, like a ghost, a courier seemed past our picket tossed, with wild hair streaming in his face, we're lost, we're lost, we're lost. Front, front, in God's name, front, he cried, our ammunition's gone. He turned a face of dazed dismay, and through the night sped on. Men, follow me, cried Mickelrath, our acting sergeant then, and when he gave the word he knew he gave the word to men. Twenty there, not one man more, but down the sunken road, we dragged the guns of Battery H, nor even stopped to load. Sudden, from the darkness poured a storm of Mauser hail, but not a man there thought to pause, nor any man to quail. Ahead the Pennsylvania's guns in scattered firing spoke. The Spanish trenches, red with flame, in fiercer volleys spoke. Down with a rush our twenty came, the open field we passed, and in among the hard-pressed tenth we set our feet at last. Up, with a leap, sprang McElrath, mud-spattered, worn and wet, and in an instant there he stood high on the parapet. Steady, boys, we've got them now, only a minute late. It's all our lads, we've got em whipped, just give em volleys straight. Then up and down the parapet, with head erect he went, as cool as when he sat with us beside our evening tent. Not one of us, close sheltered there, down in the trenches pen, but felt that we would rather die than shame or grieve him then. The fire so close to being quenched, in panic and defeat, leaped forth by rapid volleys sped in one long deadly sheet. A cheer went up along the line, as breaks the thunder call, but as it rose, great God, we saw our gallant sergeant fall. He sank into our outstretched arms, dead, but immortal grown, and glory brightened where he fell, and valor claimed her own. John Jerome Rooney Spain had had enough. She recognized the folly of struggling further, and made overtures for peace. On August 12th the protocol was signed and hostilities ceased. Eight days later the American squadron steamed into New York Harbor. WHEN THE GREAT GRAY SHIPS COME IN NEW YORK HARBOR, AUGUST twentieth, 1898 To eastward ringing, to westward winging, o'er mapless miles of sea, on winds and tides the gospel rides that the furtherest isles are free. And the furtherest isles make answer, harbor and height and hill. Breaker and breach cry each to each other, tis the mother who calls, be still. Mother! new-found, beloved, and strong to hold from harm, stretching to these across the seas the shield of her sovereign arm. 
who summons the guns of her sailor sons who bade her navies roam who calls again to the leagues of maine and who calls them this time home and the great gray ships are silent and the weary watchers rest the black cloud dies in the august skies and deep in the golden west invisible hands are limbing a glory of crimson bars and far above is the wonder of a myriad wakened stars peace as the tidings silence the strenuous cannonade peace at last is the bugle blast the length of the long blockade and eyes of vigil weary are lit with a glad release from ship to ship and from lip to lip it is peace thank god for peace ah in the sweet hereafter columbia still shall show the sons of these who swept the seas how she bade them rise and go how when the stirring summons smote upon her children's ear south and north at the call stood forth and the whole land answered here for the soul of the soldier's story and the heart of the sailor's song are all of those who meet their foes as right should meet with wrong who fight their guns till the foeman runs and then on the decks they trod brave faces raise and give the praise to the grace of their country's god yes it is good to battle and good to be strong and free to carry the hearts of the people to the uttermost ends of the sea to see the land steal up to the bay where the enemy lies in wait to run your ship to the harbor's lip and sink her across the strait but better the golden evening when the ships round heads for home and the long gray miles slip swiftly past in a swirl of seething foam and the people wait at the haven's gate to greet the men who win thank god for peace thank god for peace when the great gray ships come in guy wetmore carroll full cycle spain drew us proudly from the womb of night a lusty man-child for the western wave who now full grown smites the old midwife down and thrusts her deep in a dishonored grave john white chadwick peace commissioners from the two countries met at paris in october and a treaty of peace was signed on december tenth eighteen ninety eight spain relinquished all sovereignty over cuba and ceded puerto rico guam and the philippine islands to the united states receiving in payment for the latter the sum of twenty million dollars breath on the oat free are the muses and where freedom is they follow as the thrushes follow spring leaving the old land songless there behind parnassus disenchanted suns its woods empty of every nymph wide have they flown and now on new sierras think to set their wandering court and thrill the world anew where the republic babbling waits its speech for but the prelude of its mighty song as yet has sounded therefore would i woo apollo to the land i love tis vain unknown he spies on us and if my verse ring not the empyrean round and round tis that the feeble oat is few of stops the noble theme awaits the nobler bard then how all air will choir to it and all the great dead listen america for lo diana of the nations hath she lived remote and hoarding her own happiness in her own land the land that seemed her first in exile where her bark was cast away till maiden grew the backward-hearted child and on that sea whose waves were memories turned her young shoulder looked with steadfast eyes upon her wilderness her woods her streams inland she ran and gathering virgin joy followed her shafts afar from humankind and if sometimes her isolation drooped and yearning woke in her she put it forth with a high boast and with a sick disdain actons fleeing into antlers branched the floating tresses of her fancy and far her arrows smote them with a bleeding laugh o vain and virgin o the fool of love now children not her own are at her knee for stricken by her path lay one that vexed her maiden calm she reached a petulant hand and the old nations drew sharp breaths and looked the two-edged sword how came it to her hand the sword that slays the holder if he withhold 
that none can take, or having taken drop, the sword is in thy hand, America. The wrath of God that fillets thee with lightnings, America, strike then, the sword departs. Ah, God, once more may men crown drowsy days with glorious death, upholding a great cause. I deemed it fable, not of them am I. Yet if they love thee on the loud May day, who with exultant thunder wreathe the flag, with thunder and with victory, if they, who on the third most famous of our fourths, along the seaboard mountains swept, a storm unleashed, whose tread spurred not the wrecks of Spain. If these thy sons have loved thee, and have set Santiago and Manila like new stars, crowding thy field of blue, new terror perched like eagles on thy banners, O oh, not less I love thee, who but prattle in the prime, of birds of passage over river and wood, thine also, piping little charms to lure, uncaptured and unflying, the wings of song. Joseph Russell Taylor but the United States was still involved in a struggle altogether unforeseen and repugnant to many of her citizens. The Philippines had been bought from Spain, and with them the United States had taken over just such an insurrection as Spain had encountered in Cuba. THE ISLANDS OF THE SEA God is shaping the great future of the islands of the sea. He has sown the blood of martyrs, and the fruit is liberty. In thick clouds and in darkness he has sent abroad his word. He has given a haughty nation to the cannon and the sword. He has seen a people moaning in the terrible deaths they die. He has heard from child and woman a terrible dark cry. He has given the wasted talent of the steward faithless found to the youngest of the nations with his abundance crowned. He called her to do justice where none but she had power. He called her to do mercy to her neighbors at the door. He called her to do vengeance for her own sons foully dead. Thrice did he call unto her ere she inclined her head. She has gathered the vast midland. She has reached her borders round. There has been a mighty hosting of her children on the ground. Her searchlights lie upon the sea. Her guns are loud on land. To do her will upon the earth, her armies round her stand. The fleet at her commandment to either ocean turns. Belted around the mighty world, her line of battle burns. She has not loosed the hot volcanoes of the ships of flaming hell. With fire and smoke and earthquake shock, her heavy vengeance fell. O joyfulest May morning, when before our guns went down, the Inquisition priesthood and the dungeon-making crown, while through the red lights of battle our starry dawn burst forth, swift as the tropic sunrise that doth with glory shout. Be jubilant, free Cuba, our feet are on thy soil. Up mountain road through jungle growth are bravest for thee toil. There is no blood so precious as their wounds pour forth for thee. Sweet be thy joys, free Cuba, sorrows have made thee free. Nor thou, O noble nation, who wast so slow to wrath, with grief too heavy laden, follow in duty's path. Not for ourselves our lives are, not for thyself art thou. The star of Christian ages is shining on thy brow. Rejoice, O mighty mother, that God hath chosen thee to be the western warder of the islands of the sea. He lifteth up, he casteth down. He is the King of kings whose dread commands o'er awestruck lands are borne on eagles' wings. George Edward Woodbury The people of the Philippines had fought against Spanish sovereignty much as the people of Cuba had. A band of them, under Emilio Aguinaldo, had assisted at the capture of Manila, in the fond hope that the defeat of the Spaniards would mean Philippine independence. Instead, they found that they had merely traded masters. At once they took up arms against the Americans. Ballad of Expansion, 1899 Time was, he sang, the British brute, the ruthless lion's grasping greed, the European law of loot, the despot's devastating deed. But now he sings the heavenly creed of saintly sword and friendly fist, he loves you, though he makes you bleed, the ethical expansionist. 
He loves you, heathen, though his foot may kick you like a worthless weed from that wild field where you have root and scatter to the winds your seed. He's just the government you need. If you object, why, he'll insist, and on your protest draw a bead. The ethical expansionist. He'll take you to him, coot que coot. He'll win you, though you fight and plead. His gun shall urge his ardent suit. Relentless fire his cause shall speed. In time you'll learn to write and read. That is, if you should then exist. You won't, if you his course impede. The ethical expansionist. Envoy. Heathen, you must, you shall be freed. It's really useless to resist. To save your life you'd better heed the ethical expansionist. Hilda Johnson Misguided they no doubt were, and the warfare they waged was of the cruelest kind. But to employ them against the troops of a republic, to shoot them down as rebels, occasioned in the United States a great outburst of indignation. Rebels Shoot down the rebels, men who dare to claim their native land. Why should the white invaders spare a dusky heathen band? You bought them from the Spanish king, you bought the men he stole. You bought perchance a ghastlier thing, the Duke of Alva's soul. Freedom, you cry, and train your gun on men who would be freed, and in the name of Washington achieve a whaler's deed. Boast of the benefits you spread, the faith of Christ you hold, then seize the very soil you tread, and fill your arms with gold. Go, prostitute your mother tongue, and give the rebel name to those who to their country clung, preferring death to shame. And call him loyal, him who brags of countrymen betrayed, the patriot of the money-bags, the loyalist of trade. Oh, for the good old Roman days, of robbers bold and true, who scorned to oil with pious phrase the deeds they dared to do. The days before degenerate thieves devised the coward lie of blessings that the enslaved receives, whose rights their arms deny. I hate the oppressor's iron rod, I hate his murderous ships, but most of all I hate, O oh God, the lie upon his lips. Nay, if they still demand recruits to curse Manila Bay, be men, refuse to act like brutes, and massacre, and slay. Or if you will persist to fight with all a soldier's pride, why then be rebels for the right, by Aguinaldo's side? Ernest Crosby But the administration felt that it had gone too far to draw back. Spellbinders raised the shout that wherever the flag was raised it must remain. New regiments were shipped to the Philippines, and the war against the natives pushed vigorously. On a Soldier Fallen in the Philippines Streets of the Roaring Town Hush for him, hush, be still. Who comes, who was stricken down, doing the word of our will? Hush, let him have his state, give him his soldier's crown. The grists of trade can wait, they're grinding at the mill. But he cannot wait for his honor, now the trumpet has been blown. Wreathe pride now for his granite brow, lay love on his breast of stone. Toll, let the great bells toll, till the clashing air is dim. Did we wrong this parted soul, we will make it up to him. Toll, never let him guess what work we sent him to. Laurel, laurel, yes. He did what we bade him do. Praise, and never a whispered hint, but the fight he fought was good. Never a word that the blood on his sword was his country's own heart's blood. A flag for the soldier's beer, who dies that his land may live. O oh, banners, banners here, that he doubt not nor misgive. That he heed not from the tomb, the evil days draw near, when the nation robed in gloom, with its faithless past shall strive. Let him never dream that his bullet's scream went wide of its island mark, home to the heart of his sinning land, where she stumbled and sinned in the dark. William Vaughn Moody On February 15, 1899, General Ricardi's division of the Filipino army was encountered near Santa Ana and completely routed. 
It was at this battle that Lieutenant Charles E. Kilborn, Jr. and Lieutenant W. G. Miles performed the exploits described in the following poems. THE BALLAD OF PACO TOWN FEBRUARY 5th, 1899 In Paco Town and in Paco Tower, at the height of the tropic noonday hour, some Tagal riflemen, half a score, watched the length of the highway o'er, and when to the front the troopers spurred, whiz, whiz, how the Mausers whirred. From the opposite walls through crevice and crack, volley on volley went ringing back, where a band of regulars tried to drive the stinging rebels out of their hive. Wait till our cannon come, and then, cried a captain, striding among his men, we'll settle that bothersome buzz and drone with a merry little tune of our own. The sweltering breezes seemed to swoon, and down the calais the thickening flames licked the roofs in the tropic noon, then through the crackle and glare and heat, and the smoke, and the answering acclaims of the rifles, far up the village street, was heard the clatter of horses' feet, and a band of signalmen swung in sight, hasting back from the ebbing fight that had swept away to the left and right. Ride, yelled the regulars, all aghast, and over the heads of the signal men they whirled in desperate gallop past, the bullets a vicious music made, like the whistle and whine of the midnight blast, on the weltering wastes of the ocean when the breast of the deep is scourged and flayed. Chanced in the line of the fiercest fire, a rebel bullet had clipped the wire that led from the front and the fighting down to those that stayed in Manila town. This gap arrested the watchful eye of one of the signalmen galloping by, and straightway out of the plunge and press he reined his horse with a swift caress. In a word in the ear of the rushing steed, then back with never a halt nor heed of the swarming bullets he rode, his goal, the parted wire and the slender pole that stood where the deadly tower looked down on the rack and ruin of Paco Town. Out of his saddle he sprang as gay as a schoolboy taking a holiday. Wire in hand up the pole he went, with never a glance at the tower, intent only on that which he saw appear, as the line of his duty, plain and clear. To the very crest he climbed, and there, while the bullets buzzed in the scorching air, clipped his clothing and scored and stung the slender pole-top to which he tung, made the wire that was severed sound, slipped in his careless way to the ground, sprang back to his horse, and then was off the bravest of signalmen. Cheers for the hero, while such as he, heedless alike of wounds and scars, fight for the dear old stripes and stars, down through the years to us shall be, ever and ever, the victory. Clinton Scollard The Deed of Lieutenant Miles February 5th, 1899 When you speak of dauntless deeds, when you tell of stirring scenes, tell this story of the isles where the endless summer smiles, tell of young Lieutenant Miles in the far-off Philippines. T'was the Santa Ana fight. All along the Tagal line, from the thickets dense and dire, gushed the fountains of their fire. You could mark the rifles' ire. You could hear their bullets whine. Little wonder there was pause. Some were wounded, some were dead. Call Lieutenant Miles, he came, in his eyes a fearless flame. Yonder blockhouse is our aim, the battalion leader said. You must take it how you will, you must break this damned spell. Volunteers, cried Miles, t'was vain, for that narrow tropic lane, twixt the bamboo and the cane, was the very lane of hell. There were five stood forth at last, God above, but they were men. Come, exultantly, he saith, did they falter? Not a breath. Down the path of hurtling death, the lieutenant led them then. Two have fallen, now a third, forward dash the other three, in the onward of that race, ne'er a swerve or stay of pace, and the Toggles, dare they face such desperate company. Panic gripped them by the throat, every Toggle rifleman, as though they seemed to see in those charging foemen three an avenging destiny, fierce and fast and far they ran. So a salvo for the six, so a sound of ringing cheers, Heroes of the distant isles, where the endless summer smiles, Gallant young Lieutenant Miles, and his valiant volunteers. Clinton Scollard 
So the war went on, with massacre, ambush, and lonely murder. The conquest of the islands was proving a costly one, but the administration held that it must be carried through at whatever sacrifice. It was a war in which victory and defeat alike brought only sorrow and disgust. Aguinaldo, Patriot and Empire When arms and numbers both have failed to make the hunted patriot yield, nor proffered riches have prevailed to tempt him to forsake the field, by spite and baffled rage beguiled, strike at his mother and his child. O land where freedom loved to dwell, which shooks the despot on his throne, and o'er the beating floods of hell hope's beacon to the world has shone. How art thou fallen from thy place, O thing of shame, O foul disgrace! Thy home was built upon the height, above the murky clouds beneath. In the blue heaven's freest light thy sword flashed ever from its sheath, the weak and oppressed to save, to smite the tyrant, free the slave. Thy place was glorious, sublime, what devil tempts thee to descend to conquest, robbery, and crime? O shameful fate, is this the end? Thy hands have now the damning stain of human blood for love of gain. With weak hypocrisy's thin veil, seek not in vain to bind thine eyes, nor shall deceitful prayers prevail. Pray not, for fear the dead should rise. From neath their conquered country's sod, and cry against thee unto God. Bertrand Shadwell The capture of Aguinaldo, March 23, 1901, put a virtual end to organized resistance, though sporadic outbreaks continued for several years. As late as March 1906 such an affair occurred, a band of Moros, men, women, and children, being surrounded and killed on the summit of a crater at Dayo, no prisoners being taken. The Fight at Dayo March 7, 1906 There are twenty dead who are sleeping near the slopes of Bud Dayo, near the shadow of the crater where the bolos laid them low. And their comrades feel it bitter, and their cheeks grow hot with shame, when they read the sneering comments which have held them up to blame. They were told to scale the mountain, and they stormed its beetling crest, spite of all the frantic moros, though they did their level best. Though the bullets whistled thickly, and the cliff was lined with foes, though the campolins were flashing, and the chris gave deadly blows, there was little time for judging, ere they met in deadly strife, what the sex might be that rushing waved aloft the blood-stained knife. For the foe was drunk with frenzy, and the women in the horde thought that paradise was certain if they kill first with the sword. They'd been freely offered mercy, but they'd scorned the proffered gift, for their priests had told them Allah promised victory sure and swift. They were foolish, and their folly cost the lives of wife and son, but they fought their fight like heroes. There were none that turned to run. Though they'd robbed and slain and ravaged, though their crimes had mounted high, though tis true that naught became them like the death they chose to die, one would think to read the papers that the troops who scaled their fort were a lot of brutal ruffians shooting girls and babes for sport. More than one who's sleeping soundly neath the shade of Bud Dayo, who lost his life while giving succor to the one who dealt the blow. Yet his comrades feel more bitter, and they give him far worse name, to the men who dubbed them butchers, and have smirched the army's fame. Alfred E. Wood The Philippines, meanwhile, had been placed under a civil government, but no promise was given them of ultimate independence. Their commerce was crippled by the High Tariff Party in control of Congress, and while their condition was vastly better than it had been under Spanish rule, it was not such as a republic, working for their good, might have made it. The acquisition and conquest of the islands is believed by many intelligent and patriotic persons to be one of the darkest blots upon American history. An Ode in Time of Hesitation Written after seeing at Boston the statue of Robert Gould Shaw, killed while storming Fort Wagner, July 18th, 1863, at the head of the first enlisted Negro Regiment, 
the fifty fourth massachusetts before the living bronze st gaudens made most fit to thrill the passer's heart with awe and set here in this city's talk and trade to the good memory of robert shaw this bright march morn i stand and hear the distant spring come up the land knowing that what i hear is not unheard of this boy soldier and his negro band for all their gaze is fixed so stern ahead for all the fatal rhythm of their tread the hand they died to save from death and shame trembles and waits hearing the spring's great name and by her pangs these resolute ghosts are stirred through street and mall the tides of people go heedless the trees upon the common show no hint of green but to my listening heart the still earth doth impart assurance of her jubilant emprise and it is clear to my long-searching eyes that love at last has might upon the skies the ice is runnelled on the little pond a tell-tale patter drips from off the trees the air is touched with southland spiceries as if but yesterday it tossed the frond of pendant mosses where the live oaks grow beyond virginia and the carolines or had its will among the fruits and vines of aromatic isles asleep beyond florida and the gulf of mexico soon shall the cape and children laugh in glee spying the arbutus spring's dear recluse hill lads at dawn shall hearken the wild goose go honking northward over tennessee west from oswego to salt st marie and on to where the pictured rocks are hung and yonder where gigantic willful young chicago sitteth at the northwest gates with restless violent hands and casual tongue moulding her mighty fates the lake shall robe them in ethereal sheen and like a larger sea the vital green of springing wheat shall vastly be outflung over dakota and the prairie states by desert people immemorial on arizona mesas shall be done dim rites unto the thunder and the sun nor shall the primal gods lack sacrifice more splendid when the white sierras call upon the rockies straightway to arise and dance before the unveiled ark of the year clashing their windy cedars as for shams unrolling rivers clear for flutter of broad phylacteries while shasta signals to alaskan skies that watch old sluggish glaciers downward creep to fling their icebergs thundering from the steep and mariposa through the purple calms gazes at far hawaii crowned with palms where east and west are met a rich seal on the ocean's bosom set to say that east and west are twain with different loss and gain the lord hath sundered them let them be sundered yet alas what sounds are these that come suddenly over the pacific seas sounds of ignoble battle striking dumb the season's half-awakened ecstasies must i be humble then now when my heart hath need of pride wild love falls on me from these sculptured men by loving much the land for which they died i would be justified my spirit was away on pinions wide to soothe and praise of her passionate mood and ease it of its ache of gratitude too sorely heavy is the debt they lay on me and the companions of my day i would remember now my country's goodliness make sweet her name alas what shade art thou of sorrow or of blame liftest the lyric leafage from her brow and pointest a slow finger at her shame lies lies it cannot be the wars we wage are noble and our battles still are won by justice for us ere we lift the gauge we have not sold our loftiest heritage the proud republic hath not stooped to cheat and scramble in the market-place of war her forehead weareth yet its solemn star here is her witness this her perfect son this delicate and proud new england soul who leads despised men with just unshackled feet up the ways where death and glory meet to show all peoples that our shame is done that once more we are clean in spirit whole crouched in the sea fog on the moaning sand all night he lay speaking some simple word from hour to hour to the slow minds that heard holding each poor life gently in his hands 
and breathing on the base rejected clay till each dark face shone mystical and grand against the breaking day and lo the shard the potter cast away was grown a fiery chalice crystal fine fulfilled of the divine great wine of battle wrath by god's ring finger stirred then upward where the shadowy bastion loomed huge on the mountain in the wet sea light whence now and now infernal flowerage bloomed bloomed burst and scattered down its deadly seed they swept and died like freemen on the height like freemen and like men of noble breed and when the battle fell away at night by hasty and contemptuous hands were thrust obscurely in a common grave with him the fair-haired keeper of their love and trust now limb doth mingle with dissolved limb in nature's busy old democracy to flush the mountain laurel when she blows sweet by the southern sea and heart with crumbled heart climbs in the rose the untaught hearts with the high heart that knew this mountain fortress for no earthly hold of temporal quarrel but the bastion old of spiritual wrong built by an unjust nation sheer and strong expungible but by a nation's rue and bowing down before that equal shrine by all men held divine whereof his band and he were the most holy sign o oh, bitter bitter shade wilt thou not put the scorn and instant tragic question from thine eyes do thy dark brows yet crave that swift and angry stave unmet for this desirous morn that i have striven striven to evade gazing on him must i not deem they err whose careless lips in street and shop aver as common tidings deeds to make his cheek flush from the bronze and his dead throat to speak surely some elder singer would arise whose harp hath leave to threaten and to moan above this people when they go astray is whitman the strong spirit overthrown has whittier put his yearning wrath away i will not and i dare not yet believe though furtively the sunlight seems to grieve and the spring-laden breeze out of the gladdening west is sinister with sounds of nameless battle overseas though when we turn and question in suspense if these things be indeed after these ways and what things are to follow after these our fluent men of place and consequence fumble and fill their mouths with hollow phrase or for the end all of deep arguments intone their dull commercial liturgies i dare not yet believe my ears are shut i will not hear the thin satiric praise and muffled laughter of our enemies bidding us never sheathe our valiant sword till we have changed our birthright for a gourd of wild pulse stolen from a barbarian's hut showing how wise it is to cast away the symbols of our spiritual sway so that our hands with better ease may wield the driver's whip and grasp the jailer's keys was it for this our fathers kept the law this crown shall crown their struggle and their ruth are we the eagle nation milton saw mewing its mighty youth soon to possess the mountain winds of truth and be a swift familiar of the sun where i before god's face his trumpets run or have we but the talons and the maw and for the abject likeness of our heart shall some less lordly bird be set apart some gross-billed wader where the swamps are fat some gorger in the sun some prowler with the bat ah no we have not fallen so we are our father's sons let those who lead us know twas only yesterday sick cuba's cry came up the tropic wind now help us for we die then alabama heard and rising pale to maine and idaho shouted a burning word proud state with proud impassioned state conferred and the lifting of a hand sprang forth east west and south and north beautiful armies oh by the sweet blood and young shed on the awful hill slope at san juan by the unforgotten names of eager boys who might have tasted girls love and been stung with the old mystic joys and starry griefs now the spring nights come on but that the heart of youth is generous we charge you ye who lead us breathe on their chivalry no hint of stain turn not their new world victories to gain one least leaf plucked for chaffer from the bays of their dear praise one jot 
of their pure conquest but to hire the implacable republic will require with clamor in the glaze and gaze of noon or subtly coming as a thief at night but surely very surely slow or soon that insult deep we deeply will requite tempt not our weakness our cupidity for save we let the island men go free those baffled and dislaureled ghosts will curse us from the lamentable coasts where walk the frustrate dead the cup of trembling shall be drained quite eaten the sour bread of astonishment with ashes of the hearth shall be made white our hair and wailing shall be the tent then on your guiltier head shall our intolerable self-disdain wreak suddenly its anger and its pain for manifest in that disastrous light we shall discern the right and do it tardily o ye who lead take heed blindness we may forgive but baseness we will smite william vaughan moody end of section nine Chapter 6 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. By various authors. Section 10. Chapter 6. The New Century. No country in the world entered upon the twentieth century with brighter prospects of peace, happiness, and prosperity than did the United States. A Toast to Our Native Land. Huge and alert, irascible yet strong. We make our fitful way mid right and wrong. One time we pour out millions to be free, then rashly sweep an empire from the sea. One time we strike the shackles from the slaves, and then quiescent we are ruled by knaves. Often we rudely break restraining bars, and confidently reach out toward the stars. Yet under all there flows a hidden stream, Sprung from the rock of freedom, the great dream of Washington and Franklin, men of old who knew that freedom is not bought with gold. This is the land we love, our heritage, strange mixture of the gross and fine, yet sage and full of promise, destined to be great. Drink to our native land. God bless the state. Robert Bridges But the very first year, a bolt from the blue fell upon her. In May 1901, a great industrial exposition, known as the Pan American, was opened at Buffalo, New York. It was especially notable for its electrical display, and came to be known as the Dream City, or the City of Light. Buffalo, 1901 A transient city marvelously fair humane harmonious yet nobly free she built for pure delight and memory at her command by lake and garden rare pylon and tower majestic rose and air and sculptured forms of grace and symmetry then came a thought of god and reverently let there be light she said and light was there o oh, miracle of splendor who could know the crime insensate egoist and blind destructive, causeless, caring but to smite, would in its dull Sumerian gropings find a sudden way to fill those courts with woe and swallow up that radiance and night. Florence Earl Coates September 5th was set aside as President's Day. The attendance was very large, and President William McKinley spoke to an audience of 30,000 people. The next afternoon a reception was held, at which all were invited to pass in line and shake hands with the President. In the line was a man whose right hand was bandaged with a handkerchief. 
the handkerchief concealed a revolver as the president stretched out his hand the assassin fired twice one bullet penetrating the president's abdomen mckinley september sixth nineteen o one tis not the president alone who stricken by that bullet fell the assassin's shot that laid him prone pierced a great nation's heart as well and when the baleful tidings sped from lip to lip throughout the crowd then as they deemed their ruler dead twas liberty that cried aloud i liberty for where the foam of oceans twain marks out the coast tis there in freedom's very home that anarchy has maimed its host there tis that it has turned to bite the hand that fed it there repaid a country's welcome with black spite there judas like that land betrayed for tis no despot that's laid low but a free nation's chosen chief a free man stricken by a blow base dastardly past all belief and tyranny exulting hears the tidings flashed across the sea while stern repression hugs her fears and mouths them in a harsh decree meanwhile as the cloud though black as death is lined with hopes hopes light as life and liberty that scant of breath had watched the issue of the strife fills the glad air with grateful cries to find the sun no more obscured and with new yearnings in her eyes climbs to her watch-tower reassured london truth surgical aid was at hand it was found that the bullet had passed through the stomach. Both wounds were sewed up. Five days later, the president was pronounced out of danger. The next day he showed signs of a relapse and sank steadily until death came early on the morning of Saturday, September 14th. Faithful Unto Death, September 14th, 1901 His work is done, his toil is o'er. A martyr for our land he fell, the land he loved that loved him well. Honor his name forevermore. Let all the world its tribute pay, for glorious shall be his renown. Though duties was his only crown, yet duty's path is glory's way. For he was great without pretense, a man of whom none whispered shame, a man who knew nor guile nor blame. Good in his every influence, on battlefield, in council hall, long years with sterling service rife he gave us, and at last his life, still unafraid at duty's call. Let the last solemn pageant move, the nation's grief to consecrate, to him struck down by maniac hate, amid a mighty nation's love. And though the thought its solace gives beside the martyr's grave today, we feel tis almost hard to say God reigns and the Republic lives. Richard Hanfield Titherton The Comfort of the Trees Gentle and generous, brave-hearted, kind, and full of love and trust was he our chief. He never harmed a soul, old, oh, dull, and blind, and cruel, the hand that smote beyond belief. Strike him? it could not be soon should we find twas but a torturing dream our sudden grief then sobs and wailings down the northern wind like the wild voice of shipwreck from a reef by false hope lulled his courage gave us hope by day by night we watched until unfurled at last the word of fate our memories cherish one tender thought in their sad scope he looking from the window on this world found comfort in the moving green of trees Richard Watson Gilder Outward bound Farewell for now, a stormy morn and dark The hour of greeting and a parting brings Already on the rising wind yon bark Spreads her impatient wings Too hasty keel, a little while delay O moment tarry, O thou hurrying dawn For long and sad will be the mourner's day When their beloved is gone But vain the hands that beckon from the shore alike our passion and our grief are vain behind him lies our little world before the illimitable main yet none the less about his moving bed immortal eyes a tireless vigil keep an angel at the feet and at the head guard his untroubled sleep 
Two nations bowed above a common bier, made one forever by a martyred son, one in their agony of hope and fear, and in their sorrow one. And thou, lone traveller of a waste so wide, the uncharted seas that all must pass in turn, may the same star that was so long thy guide o'er thy last voyage burn. No one can reach where through yon sombre veil that bark to its eternal haven fares. No earthly breezes swell its shadowy sail, only our love and prayers. Edward Sidney Tylee Theodore Roosevelt, Vice President, succeeded to the Presidency. The greatest project which the new administration undertook was the construction of a ship canal across the Isthmus of Panama. This enterprise had been agitated as early as 1826, and in 1879 a French company under Ferdinand de Lesseps had secured a concession from Colombia and started to work. At the end of ten years, the company had exhausted its resources and work ceased. Panama Here the oceans twain have waited, all the ages to be mated, waited long and waited vainly, though the script was written plainly. This, the portal of the sea, opes for him who holds the key. Here the empire of the earth waits impatient for its birth. But the Spanish monarch, dimly seeing little, answered grimly, North and south the land is Spain's, and God gave it, it remains. He who seeks to break the tie, by mine honor he shall die. So the centuries rolled it on, and the gift of great Calan, like a spendthrift's heritage, dwindled slowly, age by age, to the flag of red and gold fell from hands unnerved and old, and the granite pillar gate waited still the key of fate. Who shall hold that magic key? but the child of destiny, in whose veins is mingled long all the best blood of the strong. He who takes his place by grace, of no single tribe or race, but by many a rich bequest from the bravest and the best, sentinel of duty, here must he guard a hemisphere. Let the old world keep its ways, not to him its blame or praise, not its greed or hate or fear, for all swords be sheathed here. Yea, the gateway shall be free unto all from sea to sea, and no fratricidal slaughter shall defile its sacred water. But the hand that oped the gate shall forever hold the key. James Jeffrey Roche The United States was naturally looked to to carry on the project. The matter was brought before Congress, and in 1902 the French company was bought out for the sum of $40 million. The Republic of Panama was organized when Colombia hesitated over the concession, and control of the canal route was thus secured. Darien A.D. 1513 to A.D. 1901 The American Senate has ratified the Isthmus Treaty. Washington Telegram Silent upon a peak in Darien the Spanish steel red in his conquering hand, while golden, green, and gracious, the vast land of that new world comes sudden into kin, stands Nunez de Balboa. North and south he sees at last the full Pacific roll, in blue and silver on each shelf and shoal, and the white bar of the broad river's mouth, and the long ranked palm trees. Queen of heaven, he cried, today thou givest me this for all my pain. And I, the glorious Girdon, give to Spain a new earth and a new sea to be her pride, war ground, and treasure house. And while he spoke, the world's heart knew a mightier dawn was broke. Silent upon a peak in Darien, four hundred years being fled, a greater stood on that same height, and did behold the flood of blue waves leaping, mother of all men, wise nature. And she spake the gift I gave to Nunez de Balboa. Could not keep Spain from her sins, now must the ages sweep to larger legend. Though her own was brave, here on this ridge I do foresee fresh birth. That which departed shall bring side by side, the sea shall sever what hills did divide, shall link in love. And there was joy on earth, whilst England and Columbia, quitting fear, kissed and let in the eager waters there. 
Edwin Arnold. Panama, home of the dove plant or holy ghost flower. What time the Lord drew back the sea and gave thee room, slight Panama? I will not have thee great, said he, but thou shalt bear the slender key. Of both the gates I builded me, and all the great shall come to thee for leave to pass, O Panama. Flower of the Holy Ghost, white dove, breathe sweetness where he wrought in love. His oceans call across the land. How long, how long, fair Panama, wilt thou the shocks of tides withstand? nor heed us sobbing by the strand. Set wide thy gates on either hand, that we may search through saltless sand, may clasp and kiss, O Panama. Flower of the deep embosomed dove, so should his mighty nations love. Out peal his holy temple clocks, it is thine hour, glad Panama. Now shall thy key undo the locks, the strong shall cleave thy sunken rocks swung loose and floating from their docks the world's white fleet shall come in flocks to thread thy straits o panama flower of the tropics snowy dove forbid unless they come in love how beautiful is thy domain search out thy wealth proud panama thy gold thy pearls of silver sheath thy fruitful palms thy thickets green load thou the ships that ride between attire thee as becomes a queen the great ones greet thee, Panama. Flower of the white and peaceful dove, let all men pass who come in love. Amanda T. Jones A working organization was perfected, improved machinery got into place, and when, in the fall of 1906, President Roosevelt visited the Isthmus, he found the dirt flying in a most satisfactory way. The canal was finally opened to commerce in April 1916. A Song of Panama, 1906 Chuff, 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 and a mountain bluff is moved by the shovel's song. Chuff, 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 oh, the grade is rough, a liftin' the landscape along. We are ants upon a mountain, but we're leavin' of our dent, and our teeth marks bitin' scenery, they will show the way we went. We're a liftin' half creation, and we're changin' it around, just to suit our playful purpose when we're diggin' in the ground. Chuff, 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 oh, the grade is rough, and the way to the sea is long. Chuff, 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 and the engines puff, in tune to the shovel's song. We're a shift in miles like inches, and we grab a forest here, just to switch it over yonder, so's to leave an angle clear. We're pushing leagues of swamps aside, so's we can hurry by, and if we had to do it, we would probably switch the sky. Chuff, 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 oh, it's hard enough when you're changing a job gone wrong. Chuff, 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 and there's no rebuff to the shovel a singing its song. You hears it in the morning and you hears it late at night. It's our battery keep in action with support of dynamite. Oh, you gets it for your dinner and the scenery skips along in a moving panorama to the charging shovel's song. Chuff, 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 and it grabs the scruff of a hill and boosts it along. Chuff, 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 oh, the grade is rough, but it gives to the shovel's song. This is a fight that's fightin', and the battle's to the death. There ain't no stoppin' here to rest or even catch your breath. You ain't no noble hero, and you leave no gallant name. You're a fightin' nature's army, and it ain't no easy game. Chuff, 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 oh, the grade is rough, and the way to the end is long. Chuff, 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 and the engines puff as we lift the landscape along. Alfred Damon Runyon In 1904, an industrial exposition to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the purchase of Louisiana from France was held at St. Louis and was attended by millions of people. The official hymn was written by Edmund Clarence Stedman, and was sung on the opening day by a chorus of five hundred voices. Hymn of the West O thou whose glorious orbs on high engird the earth with splendor round, 
from out thy secret place draw nigh the courts and temples of this ground eternal light fill with thy might these domes that in thy purpose grew and lift a nation's heart anew illumine thou each pathway here to show the marvels god hath wrought since first thy people's chief and seer looked up with that prophetic thought bade time unroll the faithful scroll and empire unto freedom gave from cloudland height to tropic wave poured through the gateways of the north thy mighty rivers join their tide and on the wings of morn set forth their mists to the far-off peaks divide by thee unsealed the mountains yield oars that the wealth of ophir shame and gems and rot of seven-hued flame lo through what years the soil hath lain at thine own time to give increase the greater and the lesser grain the ripening bowl the myriad fleece thy creatures graze appointed ways league after league across the land the ceaseless herds obey thy hand thou whose high archways shine most clear above the plenteous western plain thine ancient tribes from round the sphere to breathe its quickening air are fain and smiles the sun to see made one there brood throughout earth's greenest space land of the new and lordlier race edmund clarence stedman particularly noteworthy was the growing sentiment of friendship between england and america not so many years before the two countries had seemed on the verge of war but all such clouds had long since been swept away britannia to columbia what is the voice i hear on the wind of the western sea sentinel listen from out cape clear and see what the voice may be tis a proud free people calling aloud to a people proud and free and it says to them kinsmen hail we severed have been too long now let us have done with the worn-out tale the tale of an ancient wrong and our friendship last long as love doth last and be stronger than death is strong answer them sons of the self-same race and blood of the self-same clan let us speak with each other face to face and answer as man to man and loyally love and trust each other as none but free men can now fling them out to the breeze shamrock thistle and rose and the star-spangled banner unfurl with these a message to friends and foes wherever the sails of peace are seen and wherever the war wind blows a message to bond and thrall to wake for wherever we come we twain the throne of the tyrant shall rock and quake and his menace be void in vain for you are lords of a strong young land and we are lords of the main yes this is the voice of the bluff march gale we severed have been too long but now we have done with a worn-out tale the tale of an ancient wrong and our friendship shall last long as love doth last and be stronger than death is strong alfred austin within the united states a similar change was taking place the old sectional lines of north and south were being forgotten and a new generation arose and the proposal to return to the south her captured battle flags a proposal which a few years before had met with frenzied protests from fire alarm patriots received general and hearty approval those rebel flags discussed by one of the yanks shall we send back to the johnnies their bunting in token from blue to the gray that brothers in blood and good hunting shall be our new watchword to-day in olden times knights held it nightly to return to brave foemen the sword will the stars and stripes gleam less brightly if the old rebel flags are restored call it sentiment call it misguided to fight to the death for a rag yet trailed in the dust derided the true soldier still loves his flag does love die and must honor perish when colors and causes are lost lives the soldier who ceases to cherish the bloodstains and valor they cost our battlefields safe in the keeping of nature's kind fostering care are blooming our heroes are sleeping and peace broods perennial there all over our land rings a story of loyalty fervent and true one flag and that flag is old glory alike for the gray and the blue why cling to these moth-eaten banners what glory or honor to gain while the nation is shouting hosannas uniting her sons to fight spain time is ripe and the harvest worth reaping send the johnnies their flags f o b 
addressed to the care and safe keeping of that loyal old reb fitzhugh lee yes send back the johnnies their bunting with greetings from blue to the gray we are brothers in blood and good hunting is america's watchword today john h jewett on february twenty fourth nineteen o five congress directed that the flags be returned and they now rest in the capitals of the various southern states. The Song of the Flags, on their return to the States of the Confederacy, February 24, 1905. We love the wild clamor of battle, the crash of the musketry's rattle, the bugle and drum. We have drooped in the dust long and lonely, the blades that flash joy are rust only, the far-rolling war music dumb. God rest the true souls in death lying, for whom overhead, proudly flying, we challenge the foe, the storm of the charge we have breasted, on the hearts of our dead we have rested, in the pride of a day long ago. Ah, surely the good of God's making shall answer both those past awaking and life's cry of pain. But we never more shall be tossing on surges of battle where crossing the swift-flying death-bearer's reign. Again in the wind we are streaming, again with the war-luster dreaming, the call of the shell. What gray heads look up to us sadly? Are these the stern troopers who madly rode straight at the battery's hell? Nay, more than the living have found us, pale specters of battle around us. The gray line is dressed. Ye hear not, but they who are bringing your symbols of honor are singing the song of death's bivouac rest. Blow forth on the south wind to greet us, O star flag, once eager to meet us when war lines were set. Go carry to far fields of glory the soul-stirring thrill of the story of days when in anger we met. Ah, well that we hung in the churches, in quiet where God the heart searches, that under us met men heard through the murmur of praying the voice of the torn banner saying, Forgive, but ah, never forget. S. Weir Mitchell The territories of the West were clamoring for admission to statehood, and finally, in the summer of 1906, Oklahoma and the Indian Territory were admitted as one state. Arizona and New Mexico were offered joint statehood, but the former refused to link her destinies with her sister territory. Arizona No beggar is she in the mighty hall where her bay-crowned sisters wait. No empty-handed pleader for the right of a free-born state. No child with a child's insistence demanding a gilded toy. But a fair-browed queenly woman, strong to create or destroy. Wise for the need of the son she has bred at the school where weaklings fail. Where cunning is less than manhood, and deeds, not words, avail. With the high unswerving purpose that measures and overcomes, and the faith in the farthest vision, that builded her hard-won homes. Link her in her clean proved fitness, in her right to stand alone, secure for whatever future in the strength that her past is won. Link her in her morning beauty with another, however fair, and open your jealous portal and bid her enter there, with shackles on wrist and ankle, and dust on her stately forehead. And her proud eyes dim with weeping, no, bar your doors instead, and seal them fast forever. And seal them fast forever, but let her go her way, uncrowned, if you will, but unshackled, to wait for a larger day. Ay, let her go barehanded, bound with no grudging gift, back to her own free spaces, where her rock-ribbed mountains lift their walls like a sheltering fortress, back to her house and blood. And we of her blood will go our way and reckon your judgment good. We will wait outside your sullen door till the stars you wear grow dim, as the pale dawn stars that swim and fade o'er our mighty canyon's rim. We will lift no hand for the beige ye wear, nor covet your robes of state. But ah, by the skies above us all, we will shame ye while we wait. We will make ye the mold of an empire here in the land ye scorn, while ye drowse and dream in your well-housed ease that states at your nod are born. You have blotted your own beginnings and taught your sons to forget that ye did not spring fat-fed and old from the powers that bear and beget. 
But the while ye follow your smooth-made roads to a fireside safe of fears, shall come a voice from a land still young to sing in your age-dulled ears the hero's song of a strife as fine as your father's fathers knew when they dared the rivers of unmapped wilds at the will of a bark canoe the song of the deed and the doing of the work still hot from the hand of the yoke of man laid friendly wise on a neck of a tameless land while your merchandise is weighing, we will bit and bridle and rein the floods of the storm-rocked mountains, and lead them down to the plain. And the foam-ribbed, dark-hued waters, tired from that mighty race, shall lie at the feet of palm and vine, and know their appointed place. And out of that subtle union, desert and mountain flood, shall be homes for a nation's choosing, where no home else has stood. We will match the gold of your minting, with its mint stamp dulled and marred by the tears and blood that have stained it and the hands that have clutched too hard with the gold that no man has lied for the gold no woman has made the price of her truth and honor plying a shameless trade the clean pure gold of the mountains straight from the strong dark earth with no tang or taint upon it from the hour of its primal birth the trick of the money-changer, shifting his coins as he wills, ye may keep. No Christ was bartered for the wealth of our lavish hills. Yet we are a little people, too weak for the cares of a state. Let us go our way. When ye look again, ye shall find us, mayhap, too great. Cities we lack, and gutters where children snatch for bread. Numbers and hordes of starvelings, toiling but never fed. Spare pains that would make us greater in the pattern that ye have set. We hold to the larger measure of the men that ye forget. The men who from trackless forests and prairies lone and far hewed out the land where ye sit at ease and grudge us our fair one star. There yet be men, my masters, though the net that the trickster flings lies wide on the land to its bitter shame and his cunning parleyings have deafened the ears of justice that was blind and slow of old. Yet time, the last great judge, is not bought or bribed or sold. And time and the race shall judge us, not a league of trafficking men, selling the trust of the people to barter it back again, palming the lives of millions as a handful of easy coin, with a single heart to the narrow verge where craft and statecraft join. Charlotte M. Hall On the morning of Wednesday, April 18, 1906, an appalling calamity visited California, and especially the great city of San Francisco. At a few minutes past five o'clock, a severe earthquake shock desolated the cities of the Central Coast region, snuffed out hundreds of lives, and destroyed millions of dollars' worth of property. San Francisco, April 18th. 1906. Such darkness as when Jesus died, then sudden dawn drave all before. Two wee brown tomtits, terrified, flashed through my open cottage door, then instant out and off again, and left a stillness like to pain. Such stillness, darkness, sudden dawn, I never knew or looked upon. This ardent occidental dawn dashed San Francisco's streets with gold, just gold and gold to walk upon as he a patmos sang of old and still so still her streets her steeps as when some great soul silent weeps and oh that gold that gold that lay beyond above the tarn brown bay and then a bolt a jolt a chill and mother earth seemed as afraid then instant all again was still save that my cattle from the shade where they had sought firm rooted clay came forth loud lowing glad and gay, knee-deep in grasses to rejoice that all was well with trumpet voice. Not so yon city, darkness dust, then martial men in swift array, then smoke, then flames, then great guns thrust to heaven as if pots of clay, cathedral, temple, palace, tower, and hundred wars in one wild hour. And still the smoke, the flame, the guns, the piteous wail of little ones. The mad flame climbed the costly steep, but man, defiant, climbed the flame. What battles where the torn clouds keep? What deeds of glory in God's name? What sons of giants, giants, yea? 
of beardless lad or veteran gray not marathon nor waterloo knew men so daring dauntless true three days three nights three fearful days of death of flame of dynamite of god's house thrown a thousand ways blown east by day blown west by night by night there was no night nay nay the ghoulish flame lit nights that lay crouched down between this first last day i say those nights were burned away and jealousies were burned away and burned were city rivalries till all white cresseting the bay were one harmonious hive of bees behold the bravest battle won the city beautiful begun one solid san francisco won the fairest sight beneath the sun joaquin miller in san francisco fire followed the shock the water mains had been broken, and the flames were soon utterly beyond control, and raged for two days, destroying the business and principal residence portions of the city, an area of four square miles. The loss of life reached a thousand. The property lost three hundred million dollars. San Francisco Who now dare longer trust thy mother hand? so like thee thou hadst not another child the favorite flower of all thy western sand she looked up nature in thy face and smiled trustful of thee all happy in thy care she was thine alone not to be lured away down joyless paths of men happy as fair held to thy heart that she was yesterday to-day the sea is sobbing her sweet name she cannot answer she that loved thee best that clung to thee till hell's own shock and flame wrenched her swept her from the forgetting breast days darling playmate of thy wind and sun mother what hast thou done what hast thou done john vance cheney the whole country rushed to the relief of the stricken state the californians met their losses bravely and started once to build a greater san francisco to San Francisco. If we dream that we loved her aforetime, twas the ghost of a dream. For I vow by the splendor of God in the highest, we never have loved her till now. When love bears the trumpet of honor, O oh, highest and clearest he calls, with the light of the flaming of towers and the sound of the rending of walls, when love wears the purple of sorrow and kneels at the altar of grief, of the flowers that spring in his footsteps the white flower of service is chief and as snow on the snow of her bosom as a star in the night of her hair we bring to our mother such token as the time and the elements spare if we dream that we loved her aforetime adoring we kneel to her now when the golden fruit of the ages fall swept by the wind from the bough the beautiful dwelling is shattered wherein as a queen at the feast and gems of the barbaric tropics and silks of the ultimate east our mother sat throned and triumphant with the wise and the great in their day they were captains and princes and rulers but she she was greater than they we are sprung from the builders of nations by the souls of our fathers we swear by the depths of the deeps that surround her by the height of the height she may dare though the twelve league in compact against her Though the sea gods cry out in their wrath, though the earth gods, grown drunk of their fury, fling the hilltops abroad in her path, our mother of masterful children shall sit on her throne as of yore, with her old robes of purple about her and crowned with the crowns that she wore. She shall sit at the gates of the world where the nation shall gather and meet, and the east and the west at her bidding shall lie in a leash at her feet. S. J. Alexander. The regeneration was moral as well as physical, for not only was the town rebuilt, but it was rescued from the corrupt ring which for years had kept control of the city government. Resurge, San Francisco. Behold her seven hills loom white once more as marble builded Rome. Her marts teem with a touch of home, and music fills her halls at night. Her streets flow populous, and light floods every happy, hopeful face. 
The wheel of fortune whirls apace, and old time fair and dare hold sway. Farewell the blackened toppling wall, the bent steel gird, the somber pall. Farewell forever, let us pray. Farewell forever and a day. Joaquin Miller On June 24, 1908, Grover Cleveland, twice President of the United States, died at his home in Princeton, New Jersey, at the age of 71. His death called forth a remarkable tribute from men of all parties and in all walks of life, a tribute to his stainless service of the state, to his honesty, courage, and fidelity. Lowell had called him the most typical American since Lincoln. Grover Cleveland, 1837-1908 to 1908. Bring Cyprus, Rosemary, and Rue, for him who kept his rudder true, who held to right the people's will, and for whose foes we love him still. A man of Plutarch's marble mold, a virtue strong and manifold, who spurned the incense of the hour, and made the nation's weal his dower. His sturdy, rugged sense of right put selfish purpose out of sight. Slowly he thought, but long and well, with temper imperturbable. Bring Cyprus, Rosemary, and Rue, for him who kept his rudder true, who went at dawn to that high star, where Washington and Lincoln are. Joel Benton One feature of the country's growth has awakened great uneasiness. Over a million immigrants had been landing every year upon her shores, and the feeling has grown that America must cease to be an asylum for the ignorance and vice of Europe. Unguarded Gates Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, named of the four winds, north, south, east, and west, portals that lead to an enchanted land of cities, forests, fields of living gold, vast prairies, lordly summits touched with snow, majestic rivers sweeping proudly past the Arab's date palm and the Norseman's pine. A realm wherein are fruits of every zone, heirs of all climes, for lo, throughout the year, the red rose blossoms somewhere. A rich land, a later Eden, planted in the wilds, with not an inch of earth within its bound. But a slave's foot press, it sets him free. Here it is written, toil shall have its wage, and honor, honor, and the humblest man shall level with the highest in the law. Of such a land have men in dungeons dreamed, and with the vision brightening in their eyes, gone smiling to the faggot and the sword. Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them presses a wild, motley throng. Men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Hong Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn, these bringing with them unknown gods and rites, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws in street and alley, which strange tongues are loud, accents of menace alien to our air, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. O oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? On thy breast fold sorrow's children, soothe the hurts of fate, lift the downtrodden but with hands of steel, stay those who to thy sacred portals come to waste the gifts of freedom. Have a care, lest from thy brow the clustered stars be torn and trampled in the dust. For so of old the thronging Goth and Vandal trampled Rome, and where the temples of the Caesars stood, the lean wolf unmolested made her lair. Thomas Bailey Aldrich The first decade of the new century has witnessed a long stride forward toward better government. State and nation have asserted the right to regulate railroad rates, to abolish gambling, to supervise the sale of poisons and intoxicants, to protect the people from impure food, from quackery and swindling, and to break up combinations in restraint of trade. National Song America, my own, thy spacious grandeurs rise, faming the proudest zone, pavilioned by the skies. Day's flying glory breaks thy vales and mountains o'er, and gilds thy streams and lakes from ocean shore to shore. Praised be thy wood and wold, thy corn and wine and flocks, 
the yellow blood of gold drain from thy canyon rocks thy trains that shake the land thy ships that plow the main triumphant cities grand roaring with noise of gain earth's races look to thee the peoples of the world thy risen splendors see and thy wide flag unfurled thy sons in peace of war that emblem who beheld bless every shining star cheer every streaming fold float high o gallant flag o'er carib isles of palm o'er bleak alaskan crag over far-off lone guam where mauna loa pours black thunder from the deeps o'er mindanao's shores o'er luzon's coral steeps float high and be the sign of love and brotherhood the pledge by right divine of power to do good for i and everywhere on continent and wave are omnipotent to dare imperial to save William Henry Venable Especially significant has been the awakening of the public conscience, the growing intolerance of corruption in office, the demand for honesty in public as in private life, and the realization of the fact that the great public service corporations are accountable to the people and amenable to law. Ad Patrium To deities of gods and gold, land of our fathers do not bow but unto these beloved of old bend thou the brow austere they were of front and form rigid as iron in their aim yet in them pulsed a blood as warm and pure as flame honor whose foster child is truth unselfishness in place and plan justice with melting heart of ruth and faith in man give these our worship then no fears of future foes need fight thy soul Triumphant thou shalt mount the years toward thy high goal. Clinton Scholard O Land Beloved from My Country O Land Beloved, my country dear, my own, May the young heart that moved for the weak words atone, The mighty lyre not mine, nor the full breath of song, to happier sons shall these belong, yet doth the first and lonely voice of the dark dawn the heart rejoice. While still the loud choir sleeps upon the bough, and never greater love salutes thy brow than his who seeks thee now. Alien the sea and salt the foam, wherever it bears him from his home. And when he leaps to land, a lover treads the strand. Precious is every stone. No little inch of all the broad domain, But he would stoop to kiss and end his pain. Feeling thy lips make merry with his own, But, oh, his trembling reed too frail, To bear thee times all hail. Faint is my heart, and ebbing with the passion of thy praise. The poets come who cannot fail. Happy are they who sing thy pretty days. Happy am I who see the long night ended, In the shadows of the age that bore me. All the hopes of mankind blending, earth awaking, heaven descending. While the new day steadfastly domes the blue deeps over thee, happy am I who see the vision splendid in the glowing of the dawn before me. All the grace of heaven, blending, man arising, Christ descending, while God's hand in secrecy builds thy bright eternity. George Edward Woodbury So America faces the future unafraid confident that her problems will be wisely solved that a splendid destiny awaits her and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth the republic from the building of the ship thou too sail on o ship of state sail on o union strong and great Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what master laid thy keel, what workman wrought thy ribs of steel, who made each mast and sail and rope, what anvils rang, what hammers beat, in what a forge and what a heat were shaped the anchors of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock, tis of the wave and not the rock, tis but the flapping of the sail and not a rent made by the gale. In spite of rock and tempest roar, in spite of false lights on the shore, sail on nor fear to breast the sea. Our hopes, our hopes are all with thee. 
Our hopes, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant o'er our fears, are all with thee, are all with thee. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow End of section 10 Recording by Chris Pyle